Hour. I'm joined by my guests, Martin J. in Marrakesh. He is an award-winning journalist and commentator. And here in Moscow, we have Dmitry Babich. He is a political analyst and editor at InnoSME Internet Media Project. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in any time you want, and I always appreciate it. All right, let's start out with Martin in, in Marrakesh. Um, as I said in my introduction, Martin, uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron is not, you know, not the brightest guy. Um, he doesn't come up with original ideas. But every once in a while, he does say what everyone knows is obviously to be true, okay? He kind of, he's like this even odd guy on even days. He totes the line on odd days. He's, he lets something out, okay? He's a, that's probably the only reason why I follow what he has to say. But he's absolutely right about this, that what I find really interesting is the very fact that he would say something like this means it's already too late, isn't it? Go ahead, Mark. On so many levels. You know, most of what's coming out now from Macron and a few others now is too little, too late. I mean, I think it's a rather fatuous argument, actually, to to pitch the EU somewhere uh, in the middle or, or at least needing or requiring to, you know, tie their their colours to a certain mast, whether it be China or whether it be the US. I can't ever imagine it being China. Um, but, you know, Macron, he's on his own. I mean, he really is. He's, he's completely isolated um, within the EU. I disagree with you when you say he's not very bright. I think he is quite bright. I, I think you mean politically he's not very astute. But I think uh, intellectually he's quite a smart guy. And um, he's got an incredible amount of pressure on him at the moment. I mean, France is imploding. And he can't really take any much more of these strikes. Just a couple of days ago, there was a million people marching um, in Paris. And if this sort of dissent um, continues, you know, the, the, then the arguments from the unions in Paris is that you, Macron, have to go. You're the problem. But really, the essence of this is the, is the Ukraine war and where the West has pitched itself. To, for Macron to make these um, incendiary comments to the rest of the EU is really interesting because it shows that we are at a point now where there is a certain thawing of arrogance and stoic, obsessive uh, uh, focus towards the end game, as you like to call it, or you like to always call me up on this phrase, end game. Um, I think EU leaders are beginning to realize that there actually isn't an end game. Um, to the Ukraine war, and there isn't a situation where they even want to win. I mean, his comments are really interesting because they fall, what, something like a week after Guy Verhofstadt, um, the liberal leader in the pan-European group in the European Parliament, said to MEPs, MEPs, look, we're losing in the, the, the battle with the Russians. The EU sanctions just aren't working, and they amount to zero. That were his words. But he added to that, and I wrote about it in an article for TRT just a week ago, you know, Russian sanctions aren't working. He added to that, that um, not only are the sanctions not, not, not working, but things are actually becoming worse in our relations with Russia because EU countries would like, like, like at least not to trade with Russia. But in fact, only seven EU member states um, are actually importing less from Russia than before. The rest are importing more. Now let's think about that for a minute. That's that's a cataclysmic error of judgment. If you're banging your fist on the table and you know and 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 making this battle charge towards the Ukraine the war, and you think that there's an end game where the Europeans could win, so I think there's a thawing of this um, this arrogance, this mindset. Uh, also, the EU leaders are, are changing. Yeah, oh, well, because they're being forced to. Reality is forcing them to. I, I Dima also in the same interview that um, Macron made. He, he also said, um, oh, I'm going to tend to agree with Martin. He's not stupid. He's politically stupid, but he's not intellectually stupid. Okay, good point. Yeah. I take that on board. Dima, he also talked about, you know, we, we always talk about, even on this program, Europe. But, you know, even he pointed out that Europe is not united. He didn't use the word populist, but he was making reference to them. Is that... You know, of this conflict in Ukraine, well, first of all, we have like Brexit, we had the uh, catastrophic like, Merkel decision on immigration in 2015. This is uh, one event after another. The Ukraine um, situation, because the West is so vested into this obviously ridiculous gambit, is that you were even seeing um, 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 greater divisions. The divisions were always there, but they're just becoming more apparent in Europe itself. And he's making a reference, obviously, obviously to Eastern Europe, Dima. Uh, well, just uh, to quote uh, one of the news items from last week. The heads of foreign ministers of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia required, demanded from Chancellor Stoltz to ship, deliver, 
Leopard tanks to Kiev. I mean, <laughs> could you imagine it just like five years ago, or even less, you know, uh, the foreign ministers of Lithuania and Estonia are requiring something from the Chancellor of Germany, you know, <laughs> talking about Macron, uh, of course, he is not very much liked in Russia. Some people call him, even compare him to a fallen hooligan, you know, when he kept saying, I'm going to call Putin, I'm calling Putin, while at the same time sending for which uh, uh, guns to, to, to the Ukrainian gout. I mean, that was very strange what he was doing, talking about peace, while at the same time uh, adding oil to the fire in Ukraine. Uh, but you are absolutely right. If we look at the big picture, I, I think the best analysis was provided uh, by Emmanuel Todd, a French thinker. In his interview to Le Figaro uh, last week, he basically said, okay, uh, France and Germany appear to be full. I mean, they didn't anticipate uh, the Russian special operation in Ukraine. Why? Because they were not informed and, and they didn't know uh, to what extent uh, the UK, the United States, and Poland have armed Ukraine. They didn't know. And and uh, when the events unfolded late, I mean, now we are finding out uh, just comical details. I mean, the head of German Foreign Services, if we believe the spectator, was caught in Ukraine. Uh, you know, when the attack started, uh, they had to send special troops to get him out, you know, out of Kiev. Uh, the same story with France, you know, it was completely unprepared. People from the French embassy in uh, in Kiev are, are now suing, you know, the, the former ambassador for uh, putting them in a terrible situation. Uh, so basically, uh, as Emmanuel uh, Todd writes, he is, uh, in, 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 as he says in that interview, uh, the axis in Europe shifted from Paris and Berlin to Washington, London, Warsaw. I mean, isn't that a disaster for Europe, you know, to be run by outside forces with, uh, you know, uh, also being a hostage of East European nationalism? Well, and you know, what, what is government is the embodiment of East European nationalism. We, we can be surprised, I suppose, but then we kind of go back to Martin here. Then we'll shame on the European leadership. I mean, I mean, who do they call? Okay, who do they blame? They have themselves to blame for all of this. I want to add on to that here in the same interview that Macron uh, gave. Uh, he, he talked about a crisis of capitalism, which was really quite interesting coming from a banker himself. And I tend to agree with him. But and he calls it a crisis of consciences, the conscience of, dem of democracies, which I get tired of that kind of verbiage. But I would throw it to both of you. No one wants to say it, but it's a crisis of ideology. You know, this is an ideological paradigm, and it's working less and less for the majority of people in the in the countries that it rules over. This is patently obvious, and the leadership has to say, "Well, it's a crisis of democracy, a crisis of of capitalism." But it's a crisis of ideology, Martin. Yeah, it is. And um, if you if you look at that within the prism of um, not just. EU member states, but the EU itself, it's actually even worse for Brussels because Brussels is is a very young, inexperienced and rather a feral project. Um, and it's very good at um, getting 28 member states together and working out uh, new legislation for the length of windscreen wipers. Um, but on bigger picture stuff, you know, bigger policy stuff like wars and conflict, um, it's not very good. It, it, there's so much division, not just Atlanticist, um, Eastern European countries on one side and, and Franco-German Federalist on the other. There, there are more divisions than that. And I think this is what we talk about, crisis of ideology. I think it, it, this is what Macron is really touching on. He knows that there is a lack of confidence in governance generally in Western European countries. You know, And the Ukraine war has actually made this much worse because people are really starting to question um, what's this all about? I mean, how do we end up winning? Even if we win, even people are starting to say, even if the, you push Russia out of Ukraine, what, what, where are the spoils for us? It's incredible how cynical people are. It's incredible how people, even the humble London taxi drivers, uh, realize that when energy prices go back down again, governments tend not to pass that saving back on to consumers. They tend to snatch it, you know. So there's no win-win for Westerners. And um, the crisis of ideology is just becoming more and more um, obvious. It's, you know, it's really interesting um, that Dimitri brought up the uh, tanks issue. You know, incredible that um, that defence ministers 
would openly discuss this and make it a public thing. I find that incredible, you know, because Putin must be laughing his head off. You know, so we've got to the stage now where, first of all, we give credibility to the Ukrainians for knowing how to run their own war. Ha, ha, ha. You know, try and stop laughing at that. They don't know what they're doing there. But if we're going to give some credibility at all to the cabal of advisors to, to, to Zelensky, you know, do they really know what they're talking about when they say that, look, the silver bullets in Ukraine are tanks? I'm not even sure I agree with that. I'm wondering whether they've got some deal lined up with some Middle Eastern buyer um, or, or has, or, you know, recently African leaders now have started to point out that these, this equipment is starting to turn up in the Central African Republic. So is it already about tanks? Is it really, do we, can we really answer? My bullshit antenna is twitching a lot when I hear these stories about tanks. But if it tanks is- Tanks are fungible. Tanks are fungible. Yeah, but if it is about tanks, you know, first of all, Zelensky hasn't got the people to, to, to run these, to, 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 to operate in these tanks. But isn't it interesting how Biden has pulled back um, from sending Abraham tanks, which are probably the best tanks in the world, um, to Ukraine and the excuses that he's come up with, which is probably annoying the Europeans a lot, you know, that it really is, this war really is about um, winners and losers and Europe is just a loser over and over again, whatever the scenario they, is. They, they, Martin, but the Abrams tanks, just to kind of go along with what I just said here, I mean, it would end up in a, in a, in a showroom in Moscow. I mean, it would, they, they would be sold. They'd be sold, okay? They'd be sold. I know, but it's all, it's, it's all BS. It's, it's all BS because, you know, the, the, Biden is saying, oh, you know, these tanks are quite complicated. Um, they don't have the right fuel in Ukraine and uh, there's training involved. For goodness sake, these tanks rolled into Iraq in a matter of minutes in the, into the desert. You know, so why can't they be sent to Ukraine? It's BS. We're being, we're being lied to by the Americans again. And I think Macron, to give him credit, let's give him just one minor point of credit here, which hurts me. I think he's the only EU leader who's prepared to stand up and actually say this to the Americans, that you're really trying to pull the wool over our eyes. You know, we are the ones who are going to pay the biggest price here. And the whole issue about the tanks is interesting because EU leaders now, I think, are starting to admit openly that they don't actually want Western countries or Europe to actually win the war in Ukraine. That's not what they want. Certainly Germany doesn't want that. What Germany wants, or it believes, is it can war win a war finally of attrition, that slowly we can wear out. In the year, I have to go to a hard break, and after that hard break, we'll continue our discussion on some real news. Okay, let's go back to Dima here in Moscow. And one of the things I think is interesting here, since we're talking about Macron, then we can throw in who I call um, uh, Sergeant Schultz here. You know, and, and there seems to be concerted effort. I've talked about this many times that uh, London and Washington really just want to get rid of Schultz. They don't like social Democrats. They never have. But Macron and, and Schultz are, if you, if you watch them, observe them carefully, they're the only two European leaders that are actually thinking about the day after, the week after, the month after, the year after this conflict comes to it. You see, it comes in there every, all the time. Because, and, I, and that's an implicit, if not the way I read it, explicit um, admission that this is just a failed strategy. And the sooner we get it over, the better for everyone. Dima. Uh, well, uh, I think you were right to mention ideology before in order to understand uh, how the French and the Germans brought themselves into this mess. The key word is ideology. You know, I remember uh, in his memoirs, uh, Andre Alexandrov Agendor, who was Brezhnev's advisor, foreign policy advisor. You know, he was asked, uh, why did Brezhnev go to Afghanistan? And, and uh, Alexander Fagenov was had not been informed about it. I mean, he called Andropov in the morning of the invasion and asked how we're going to deal with Amin. And Andropov said, Amin is dead. Stop the conversation. <laughs> and and uh, Alexander Fagenov, in his explanation, he wrote that basically Brezhnev was a hostage to ideology. He thought that he had to do it, you know, because of his obligations before their communist ideology, before uh, the, the murdered Afghan leader Taraki. In the same way, uh, in, in Germany, politicians are becoming hostages of ideology. You can't imagine, I mean, I read German press every day. If, if there is a hint of dissent, like hint of doubt, should we send arms to Ukraine? Immediately that person is called Putin Verstehr, uh, Putin's friend, you know, is on the payroll of Moscow. How do these uh, petrodollars feel in your pocket? You know, all of these insulting, terrible statements. 
And, uh, and uh, uh, I think this is a very important uh, feature of totalitarians. They like to uh, uh, accuse Russia of totalitarians. Well, in Germany now, and in France to a less extent, uh, they, mix, uh, they mix up politics and morals. If you are against sending arms to Ukraine, you are an immoral person. You know, they, 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 they make the same, they basically use the same tactics as in the 30s and in the 40s. If you are not for Germany, if you are not for Hitler, you are, uh, you are betraying your mother, you are, uh, you are a traitor. So uh, basically, uh, you're absolutely right uh, that uh, these people, they understand uh, what a mess they get themselves into. Well, that's why Scholz has been dragging his feet or one second tanks. He yeah. pretended he didn't have them. Yeah, but what about the morality to both of you about uh, prolonging a war that has already come to an end? I mean, in the 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 uh, destruction of infrastructure, the suffering of civilians, and and this loss of soldiers. I mean, it is unconscionable to continue this conflict the way they have. But this is where we are. I want to talk about another European character here, Joseph Burrell. I'm always happy when he talks as he gives <laughs> plenty to react to plenty. This guy is going to go down in history, okay? He's probably speaking more blunders than anyone else in such a short amount of time. Uh, Martin, Burrell said, incredibly, he said, I want to stress this to everyone, incredibly, he said the following, the West must keep arming Ukraine because Moscow defeated Napoleon and Hitler. I mean, this is, I don't know what kind of history this guy is talking about, but wouldn't that be a clue like, we got to wrap this up? Because history tells us, what is this guy talking about? Why does he have the position that he does? It's, it's no, terrible. No. There's only one silver lining in this cloudy, which is I can assure you, after working in Brussels for 11 years, that most EU senior officials and EU press don't take him very seriously. I mean, his position was never a serious position. You know, the, this top the EU diplomat here, when, when the Brits run, run that particular circus, the, the ideology in Brussels was we never take, and we can't take EU foreign policy very seriously. So it's really important that we get some third-rate politician, and no one who has no real clout, no real gravitas in, he fits that bill. He's a socialist from a Mediterranean country, and he's basically just yada, yada, yada. No one really takes him very seriously. But I think, to go back to Macron, I'm sorry to make the link, but I think we do take Macron seriously. And Macron is a very good public speaker, and he has respect around the world. And I'm surprised he hasn't picked up on something else he said just in the last couple of days. He said, he stated that and this feeds into this this failed state ideology idea that you've come up with, which I agree with, which is that because we, we don't have a singular ideology, we don't have an ideology that anyone could even really take seriously in the longer term. The EU does not have any ideology at all um, beyond Brussels. But he, Macron said that we need to reach out to the Russians. We need to actually understand the way that they think and, and actually ask them, well, what would be your defense um, guarantees? in Ukraine if we were ever to talk about that. That's amazing. It's an amazing admission that we've got to this position where our own ideas are a complete failure. We're not winning. Um, we can't see any end game. Uh, our own people are just suffering. You know. But then almost in the same day, Macron also makes a statement that we want, we should increase our supplies to you, Ukraine and support the Ukrainians. That's, you know, what, what the hell is going on here? You know, there's no <laughs> I wasn't going to really focus so much on Macron on this, but I think you bring up a very good point. I wanted to explain to you my frustration, okay? I was very dismissive in my introduction. I, I, you kind of pushed back. I've kind of agreed with you. I mean, he's not, he, intellectually, he is bright. Politically, he is stupid. But I guess what my frustration is here, being a successor to de Gaulle, which every French president compares himself to de Gaulle, he's not a leader. See, that's my gripe. He's not a leader. And he can say the right things, but if you don't have any power, the gravitas, the charisma of that office, the, uh, in, in that historical standing, then it really irritates me to the point of being dismissive. I think I've explained myself. Your thoughts? Yeah, but he. But the thing is, he's not a great leader, but um, he is the president of France, and he's got another at least three years in office, and he's beginning to see that he's not going to make it. He's beginning to see that the EU project which he'd like to be the president of in 2029. And he's the favorite, in my view, to become the, the president. There won't be anything left of the EU in 2029. It'll be a crackpot, lunatic, 
you know, um, outfit um, overrun by far-right MPs of the European Parliament, and everybody at that point would be looking to the leader to streamline it. So in one respect, you know, the Ukraine war is pushing this agenda. The Ukraine war is winning on so many levels. You know, we, we always talk on this program about the Ukraine war beyond the Ukrainian borders. And this is another way of where Russia is thinking long term and thinking, you know, the EU is definitely crumbling. It's really falling to pieces. You've got people disagreeing with each other about how to move forward. Most leaders don't want to win like Germany because they fear uh, reprisals, uh, revenge attacks from, from Russia. The Americans are pretty smart and realize that that's a possibility. They don't want to send their tanks or their long, long range uh, missiles there, uh, keeping out of it. You know, let Europe pay the price for all of this. Um, but uh, Macron sees um, failure and doom and despair. And uh, this is why he's now banging the drum and talking about um, the possibility of talking to Russia about peace. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, the failed ideology and, and people, I mean, the actual, the 400 million citizens that make up the EU that are going to be part of this at some point, whether we talk about European elections next in, in a couple of years' time or Macron's policies um, failing and strikes becoming even bigger. The nightmare for Macron is now farmers go on strike and they'll start calling for him to be removed from yes, From an outsider looking in, I mean, you know, Dima, Europe is not poor. I mean, it's population, the European Union's population is larger than the United States. The GDP is larger if you look at collectively here. But he doesn't have its own Google. It doesn't have its own Amazon. Not that I think they're great things. Again, they don't have their own Facebook, but as if I, that's a great thing. But it, it's really, I, I mean, from an outsider looking, and it, it, they have everything that's necessary to be a great power. However, they've chosen not to. It is a craven choice. And I think that the historians will be very curious how they got to a, where they are today. Go ahead, Dima. Oh, uh, hostage to ideology. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the the story with Macron, one of the few wise statements that he made in the last two weeks was uh, he said that uh, in the end we will have negotiation after Ukraine kind of stands up to Russia and we will have to take into account Russia's security concerns. Yep. And what happened? All of the uh, French press, all of the German press unleashed hell on him, you know, said, how can you mention this? You know, Russia's security concerns. Uh, and then they asked, why is Russia fighting in Ukraine? Why is Russia not giving up? Well, because uh, you are not going to take into account our security consideration. But Dima, hey, Mark, hang on, hang on here. What, what is frustrating for, for that? Because with the, the legacy media, mainstream media, they never give context. But I think all of us were talking until we were all blue in the face that the Russians gave them that opportunity in December of 2021. We need security guarantees. We need to sit down right. and talk. it's getting to a point of going beyond, you know, no, no, no point. Of and they didn't believe it. Go ahead. Go ahead. They didn't believe it. And uh, you're absolutely right uh, about uh, the context. I mean, Emmanuel thought in his interview, he says, yeah, it depends on the lens that you are using. If you just uh, point your lens to Ukraine in February 2021, uh, sorry, 2022, you will see Russian troops moving from east to west. But if you zoom out a little bit, and if you take the time, uh, like 10 years, 20 years, 15 years, you see lots of soldiers moving from west to east. You'll see NATO expanding to, uh, in 1999, to Poland, the Czech, uh, Czech Republic, and Hungary in 2004. Uh, taking the Baltic republics, Romania suddenly became a very hostile country towards Russia. So if you take the big picture, Russians are responding, you know, they are not uh, uh, starting the mess. They are responding to this huge movement uh, of Western troops from West to East uh, that took place in the last 10 years at least. So uh, again, these people lack context. And because they lack context, uh, the only way they can defend their position is to just to uh, lash out at any kind of opponent. You can't imagine what's going on in Europe right now. I mean, uh, uh, all the people who are objecting to this, they immediately label uh, populists at best, far right, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Sarah Wagner, just because she said that she agreed with an article in their Focus magazine that uh, the United States and China profited from this situation while Europe is losing. She was named, uh, she was called names by thousands of people, you know, on Twitter and elsewhere. 
And, and the reality is, you know, I'm just quoting Gabor Steingart uh, from uh, uh, the Focus magazine. He basically has proven that the biggest winners from this mess, they're first the U.S. defense companies. They're also European defense companies such as BAA, BAE in, uh, in uh, the U.K. and Leonardo in Italy. Uh, let's not uh, forget, you know, the economic interests here. Hey, and the losers are you I should, I'm glad we finally got to the point who benefits from this catastrophe, okay? And we just did. It's all the uh, time we have. I want to thank my guest in Marrakesh and Moscow.